Um, before we get on to the main part of the uh, talk, I would just like to say a couple of words of uh, in, uh, introduction and um, what, what the evening is going to be. Um, I am the new chairman of the IRIS, and so this is my first, my baptism of fire, so pardon me if I get anything wrong. Um, we would like to invite you to stay behind with us after the lectures. Um, there's tea and coffee, other goodies in the back here. There's our shop to the left, which uh, any of you who haven't already had the opportunity, there's plenty of interesting things there. And also, we're running a raffle, which will draw towards the end of the evening. My role, as I say, is just to talk about the other. You'll notice also that we have cameras. Um, we are going to film and record the talk. So I would ask people, if possible, to keep the hub up as low as possible. That's preferably zero. Uh, we're not going to send you out if you make noise, but uh, if you have to cough or, or whatever, that's uh, fine. We all have problems. But we would ask you to leave the talking until afterwards. <coughs> Colin Scott, on my right, as most of you know, was my predecessor as chairman, and it was our privilege the other day at the meeting to appoint him now as our honorary president. We felt his talent was too good to be wasted by letting him disappear through the door, and he's gratefully accepted. So I would ask him at this stage, and because of his appropriate uh, history of actually planning this meeting tonight, to take over at this point and introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Simon. I'm doing my best to speak up. I not, haven't got quite such a... Uh, I was going to say penalty. That's what I mean. <laughs> uh, such a loud voice as some people. <laughs> However, I, I, I will try. Um, now, it falls to me, of course, to introduce our speaker. This is, this is our seventh St. Columbus Day uh, lecture that we have put on. And um, each year it's always been something different, <coughs> very different. <coughs> but this year it's going to be very different indeed. Um, the date of St. Columbus Day actually falls in the spring of the year. Uh, but with us it has become a movable feast. Uh, the autumn has tended to be more convenient for the public and for the speakers. So that's why we tend to have our St. Columbus Day uh, lecture in September or October. I'm sure Cal Killian would have no objections to us playing around with his dates. We hope that our speakers will advance significantly our uh, knowledge or of some related uh, um, topic related to the high church during their time at the podium. And of course, uh, Mr. McLeod here on my right is going to talk to us about the climate of the cloud. And we know all of us here, the close connection that the clan had, or has, with um, the English Kalkilia. As many will also know, we print copies of each year's speech for sale at the next year's talk. And this evening we, should, we have last year's speech, along with all the, the five before that, available on hand for purchase. And if you have not already bought one, um, I suggest you take this opportunity to bring your library up to date. Because remember, once the print runs run out, it's unlikely to be reprinted for a very long time. Although we do have academic hopes that someday the author will put a sufficient number into our first volume of transactions of our society. We think that we 
would probably become a learned society in the, in the room. It would be very good. But that volume may be dec decades off. As I said, tonight's offering promises to be different. Our speaker, however, for the first time, is not of Lewis extraction. He is of a cloud, right enough, but of a sky provenance. And that, even that, is of several generations back. His given names are Andrew Pierce. Neither be common clan names here. But that has not stopped him from becoming obsessed, and that's his own word, uh, with the gene ge genealogy of his, of his clan. He is, by training, an IT computer programmer, and thus operates in a universe altogether alien from anything I know anything about. But uh, at least my generation acknowledges that it's a very important uh, discipline that he has. And he has applied his undoubted skills to uncover and correct what he sees as the mistakes of prior historians and has volunteered, you know the term, uh, to put the record straight so far as they can. Clans as we know them, or as how we've been taught to recognize them up to now, uh, did not really come into existence until after the day, with, along with the downfall of the lordship of the Isles in the 15th and 16th centuries. But I suspect our speaker is going to go much further back to describe a descent, including one Lyot, who was king of man in the Isles, uh, a long, long time ago. And his name comes down to both the Lewis McLarens and the Harris, otherwise to be <coughs> But we will listen attentively to whatever is placed before us. Andrew Pierce MacLeod was actually born in Perth. His father was in the army, and Andrew's childhood was spent in Malaya, Kenya, Aden, and Kent, all far away from this, this period. He's the first of his line for a long time, for four generations, to have been born in Scotland. His patronymic runs something like Mac in his old, Mac Alistair, who planted the sky based land line in England, Mac Paramount, Mac Ian, Mac Alistair, Mac Lloyd, Mac Alistair, all seemingly from Sky, and Mac Callum of Rasi at the end of the 17th century, which may thus give him a connection with the Lewis MacLeods as they. As we all know, the Razi McLarens were a cadet of the Shia Polity. He has published an article for the Clan Cloud magazine for October 2000, number 91, if anyone wants to try to get a hold of one, on the ancestry of the world. He is currently the genealogy coordinator for the Associated Clan McLeod Society. Worldwide organization, synchronizing if that's the correct term. But I think, so far, so far as that may be possible, the activities of many such uh, societies all over our planet. But he informs us that his interests have expanded well beyond the clouds and now covers the origins of many other clans in the Western Highlands and Islands. Uh, the modern accounts of which he states so, is really fascinating, are often riddled of error. It's not hard indeed to find myths of how one family was hard done by another, uh, and with the, myth, the same myth repeated, but the, the, the personalities just altered for, to suit. Uh, um, but almost repeating word for word in tenaciously maintained traditions of the quite separate clans. 
but to disentangle competing versions to provide a level of beauty is a Herculean task. And <coughs> I'm sure that Andrew is going to pleasantly surprise all of us. So, <coughs> I hope your faith is not misplaced. <laughs> may I call upon you to address this meeting. Thank you very much. Before we start, I shall offer three explanations. First, William Cumming, my colleague in my cloud studies, is responsible through his correspondence with Liz Chapman for me giving this lecture today. William is a school teacher in England and deeply regrets that he cannot be here in person. However, he is here in spirit because, and I'm very grateful to him for this, he has put together the PowerPoint presentation that illustrates this lecture. So, yes, we are risking the notorious death by PowerPoint. Second, the close interplay between the text and the illustrations for this lecture means that in order to avoid it becoming a confusing mess, I shall stick rigidly to reading from my script. And so today we're risking not just death by PowerPoint, but scripted death by PowerPoint. Third, this lecture occasionally refers to Gallic texts. Unfortunately, I do not speak Gallic, and so, to avoid mangling the language, I shall usually re read out English translations when Gallic appears on the screen. That having been said, let us begin. In 1833, in a description of the parish of Stornoway that would be published in 1845, the Reverend John Cameron wrote, Tradition relates that, in the chapel at Eye, 18 lairds of MacLeod, the original possessors of the island, were buried under one stone. W.C. Mackenzie claimed otherwise, stating in 1903, the church at Eye was regarded by the MacLeods of Lewis as a place of peculiar sanctity, being their burying ground. 19 of the Shield Torkel, according to tradition, were interred there. In 1970, William Matheson noted, there is a saying in Lewis to the effect that 21, in some versions 19, MacLeod chiefs lie under the one tombstone in the churchyard at Eye. They are, in fact, buried within the church. Back in 1952, under his pen name of McGillicallum, Matheson had written in the Stornoway Gazette, It seems clear that there are, or were, some MacLeods in Lewis who believed themselves to be descended from one of the legitimate sons of Roderick MacLeod, the last of his line to enjoy undisputed possession of the island. And it is to be noted that the only legitimate son known to have left male issue was Torkeldew. There were certain families of MacLeods who claimed the right to burial within the old church at Eye, next to the slab under which 19, some say 21, MacLeod chiefs were laid to rest. I shall return to Matheson's Stornoway Gazette article later, but first I shall look at the genealogy of the MacLeods of Lewis and the possibility of surviving lines of descent from a legitimate son of old Rory, the last undisputed MacLeod of Lewis. The earliest surviving narrative account of the MacLeods of Lewis was written circa 1673 by Sir George Mackenzie later first Earl of Cromarty, who claimed that his grandmother was the heiress of Old Rory and who fiddled the genealogy of the Lewis MacLeods in an attempt that only narrowly failed to have himself recognised as, as the chief of all the MacLeods. Undoing the damage caused by Sir George is taking a long time. Major advances in our understanding of the genealogy have only occurred in the past 70 years or so, beginning with works by William Matheson concerning not only the MacLeods of Lewis, but also the ancestry of the MacLeods. We do not have time here to explain the revisions to the genealogy, which includes my own recent work, but the two pedigrees on the handout show the current results of this research. Old Rory, born circa 1501, was probably only a teenager when his father died, and he was early associated with the Mackenzies. He may not have reached his age of majority when he married his first wife, a daughter, usually named Janet, of Kenneth Mackenzie of Kintail. She was the widow of Mackay of Strathnaver, and Sir George Mackenzie admitted, 
she had come to a greater age than suited well to his youth. A son was born and named Torkel, whom old Rory would later disown, believing that not he, but Ustian Morrison, the future breve of Lewis, was the boy's father. Janet Mackenzie eloped to Coigac with John MacLeod of Raza, and her son Torkel was raised by the Mackenzies in Strathconnan, so acquiring the byname Conanac. The Mackenzies' support of Torkel Conanac's claim to be MacLeod of Lewis would eventually lead to them taking Lewis <coughs> from the MacLeods. Torkel Conanac was the father of Sir George Mackenzie's grandmother. Old Rory's second wife, whom he married circa 1541, was Barbara Stewart, daughter of Andrew Lord Avondale, who bore him one son, Torkel Ira, so by named because he was his father's designated heir apparent. His royal Stuart connections made his position unchallengeable by Torkel Conanac and the Mackenzies. Had he have lived, the history of Lewis would have been very different but he drowned as a young man, apparently in December 1565, leaving the succession to Lewis to be fought over for a few years between Torkel Conanac and MacDonald of Slate, who had a claim via his mother. Possibly in 1569, Old Rory married a third wife, Janet, daughter of Hector MacLean of Duart, which marriage, with its prospect of producing more legitimate sons, was probably what prompted Torkel Conanac to capture Old Rory and hold him prisoner for two years before bringing him before the Regent of Scotland, where he was forced to resign his estates to the Crown, whereupon a Crown Charter of February 1572, reserving the life rent to Old Rory, was granted to Torkel and his male heirs, failing whom to Malcolm Garve of Raza and his male heirs. From this it would seem that no son had been born to Old Rory's third wife during the two years of his captivity. However, Old Rory revoked the Royal Charter in June 1572, and Janet MacLean would later bear him two sons, Torkel, commonly by name Do, and Tormod. After Old Rory died circa 1595, Torkel, Do, and Tormod continued to dispute the possession of Lewis with Torkel Conanac, and also with the five adventurers, Lowlanders who, from 1598 and with royal blessing, tried to colonise Lewis in the course of which Torkel Dew was kidnapped and beheaded in July 1597 and Tormod was eventually imprisoned in Edinburgh for 10 years before being exiled to the Netherlands in 1615. Torkel Dew's by name, with its connotations of black deeds, was used by his enemies and so is the one found in public records and thence in history books, but Torkel's friends and relations used other by names. The Book of Clan Ranald twice refers to him under the by name Og, Another by name appears in an agreement of 1605 in which Rory Moore MacLeod of Harris referred to two of his nephews as William and Torkel MacLeod, sons to the late Torkel Donald MacLeod, my sister's sons. Frankly, I prefer to use the by name Og for Torkel, but to avoid confusion, it will be simpler to continue using Do. It would seem that Torkel Do was only conceived after Old Rory's release from captivity in 1572 and so he would have been born no earlier than the end of 1572, but perhaps more likely in 1573. As he was beheaded in July 1597, he can have been no more than 24 years old when he died, but even so, by his wife Margaret, sister of Rory Moore MacLeod of Harris, he left four known children, three sons, Rory, William and Torkel, and one daughter, Sheila. Sheila, perhaps born circa 1597, is recorded in the 17th century Book of Clan Ranald as having married John MacDonald of Kinloch Moidart with issue four sons, Donald, Alexander, John Dew and Rory. Sheila will be mentioned again briefly later in this lecture. Rory, William and Torkel, perhaps born circa 1594, 1595 and 1596 respectively, were fostered separately the younger two with Rory Moore MacLeod of Harris and Donald Cam Macaulay and Lewis, and the eldest, Rory, with Donald Gorm Moore MacDonald of Slate, apparently from, at the latest, 1605, which would explain why he was not named with his two brothers in Rory Moore's agreement of that year. The Mackenzies were desperate to get the three brothers into their own hands, <coughs> and by first kidnapping Macaulay's foster son, and then having the Privy Council force MacDonald and MacLeod to hand over their foster sons, they seem to have achieved this in July 1610, 
whereupon they immediately invaded Lewis. Their conquest of the island was made complete when Neil Oa MacLeod abandoned Berezé in the winter of 1612-1613, by when the Mackenzies were being led by the tutor of Kintail, Rory Mackenzie of Coigach. He kept custody of the eldest brother, Rory, but seems to have released the younger brothers, William and Torkel, into the care of their uncle, Sir Rory Moore MacLeod of Harris, with William, as servitor to his uncle, signing a bond in August 1616. News of the brothers, written within a year or two of 1620, appears in various manuscript accounts of the Troubles of the Lewis. The original text probably said this, Rory MacLeod, the eldest son of Torkel Doom MacLeod, is in the tutor of Kintail's custody. William MacLeod, the second son of Torkel Doom, is at the University of Glasgow. Torkel MacLeod, the third son of Torkel Doom, is with his uncle, Sir Rory MacLeod of the Harris, and is a youth of good expectation. Over 200 years later, an account of the MacLeods of Raza, published in 1838, included this text. Of the three sons of Torkel Doo, Roderick, William and Torkel, it is said that Roderick, the chief, went abroad <coughs> and died soon afterwards in Flanders, without children. William, the second, died very young at the University of Glasgow, Torkel, who by the death of his elder brothers became chief of the Shield Torkel, remained for a time with Sir Roderick MacLeod of Harris, his uncle. He then went to London and endeavoured to obtain some redress from the king. But failing in this, he went to Paris, where he was introduced to Henry IV, then monarch of France, as a brave man who had suffered much injustice in his own country. Henry generously gave him an appointment at his own court, and Torquil, adopting France as his native country, remained there until his death. He left no legitimate children to inherit his claims. That Torquil is said to have left no legitimate children rather implies that he had illegitimate issue. Unfortunately, the 1838 account is not entirely trustworthy. Henry IV of France died in 1610, and so he would not have met Torquil. I have no information with which to corroborate or refute the claim that Rory died abroad childless. However, the account of William is quite simply wrong. William did not die very young at the University of Glasgow. He matriculated at Glasgow University in 1619 and graduated Master of Arts in 1622, still signing MacLeod documents during his time there, before returning to be a servitor for his uncle signing documents as late as September 1625, when he must have been about 30 years old. Uniquely, the 1838 account does not specify that he left no legitimate issue. Historically, William is the latest known survivor of the three brothers, and he is the only one of them who is known to have stayed in Scotland. If there was one of Torquil Dew's three sons who had managed to leave a surviving line in Scotland, then it would have been William there is traditional evidence that he did indeed leave such a line. <clears throat> In a paper on some Raza traditions, Dr. Sam McLean, more famous as the poet Sawley McLean, made this statement. It is said that there are five MacLeod families in Raza who are not connected as far as is known on the male MacLeod side. Some years ago, I asked the late Ewan MacLeod, Ewan Torhul Callum MacTarmid, then in his 90s, of which of the five families he was. His reply was, it is not of the people of Raza we were at all. We came from Lewis, from Torquil Dew, who was hanged. Historical records supply the name of one earlier generation, but that still only takes the line back to the mid-18th century, and it is no longer known when and under what circumstances the ancestor of this family came to Raza. Therefore, although suggestive, this evidence is not of much help. In January 1871, Alexander Carmichael, an avid collector of folklore, was at Linnaclet, Ben Becula. His notebook records the lineage of an 85-year-old Hector MacLeod. Hector, son of Donald, son of Mercad, son of Neil, son of Kenneth, son of John, son of Rory, son of Norman, son of William, son of Torquil MacLeod of Lewis. This is then followed by a muddled tradition explaining how Hector's great-grandfather, Neil, 
came to the Clan Ranald estates, accompanying a bride for Clan Ranald, before ending with a sentence linking Hector with Clan Ranald. The muddled tradition, unless resolved, might cast doubt on the accuracy of the lineage. However, although I have no time to go into detail here, the tradition is clearly a confusion of two marriages. One was the arranged marriage of circa 1720 between Ranald MacDonald of Clan Ranald and William MacLeod of Berner's daughter Margaret, whose bridal retinue included Hector's grandfather, Neil. The other marriage, a century earlier, was apparently the result of the elopement of Ranald's great-granduncle, John MacDonald of Kinloch Moidart, with Neil's great-great-great-grandaunt Sheila, here called Sheena, daughter of MacLeod of Lewis, who was mentioned earlier as the daughter of Torquil Du, MacLeod of Lewis. Hector's given age of 85 years in January 1871 suggests the birth year of circa 1785, but would seem to have been a rounding up, because the last sentence of the tradition suggests that Hector was born in the same year as Ranald George MacDonald of Clan Ranald, i.e. 1788. If Hector was actually born in 1788, then that would give his lineage the admittedly short but still acceptable average generation length of 24 years. Circa 1720, Hector's great-grandfather Neil, born circa 1716, would have been a small boy of about four years of age, so it would have been as part of his father Kenneth's family that he was included in Margaret MacLeod's bridal retinue from Bernera. Neil was the last in the line to have been born on the MacLeod estates, which may explain why he, and not his father, was named as the immigrant ancestor. If Neil came from Bernera, which belonged to MacLeod of Harris, then that can only support the family's claim of descent from Torquil Du's son, William, who is last on record in 1625 in attendance on his maternal uncle, Sir Rory Moore MacLeod of Harris. Therefore, I believe that Hector's lineage is an acceptable account of a descent from William, son of Torquil Du, MacLeod of Lewis. One notes that circa 1690, a generation earlier than the marriage of circa 1720, Sir Norman MacLeod of Berner's daughter Catherine married Alexander MacLeod of Raza. Perhaps Catherine also had a bridal retinue, and perhaps that explains the origin of the Lewis MacLeods in Raza. I now return to William Matheson and his article, published under his pen name of McGillicallum, in the Stornoway Gazette of the 30th of December 1952. He illustrated his claim that there were certain families of MacLeods who claimed the right to burial within the old church at Eye, with this story of a prevented burial. A man of the name of MacLeod died, and his relatives proposed to inter him next to the famous slab. This proposal was strongly resisted by another MacLeod present, who claimed that distinction for his own branch of the family. So fierce was the altercation that it was only with difficulty that the two factions were prevented from coming to blows. Finally, one of the leading protagonists thought to settle the argument by drawing himself up to his full height and saying, Lewis belongs to me. <coughs> Later on in the same article, <coughs> Matheson wrote, It is known that the MacLeods of Mirlister in Uig buried their dead in the church at Eye, but in this he had been misinformed as he later came to realise. The relevant family was not the MacLeods of Mirlister in Uig, but the MacLeods at 11 Melbost in Eye, with whose representative, John, Matheson later corresponded. Unfortunately, Matheson's correspondent, John MacLeod, who was born in 1879 and died in 1961, could trace his lineage no farther back than his great-great-grandfather, Torkel, who was apparently the last man to have been buried under, not next to, the relevant slab in the church at I. Also, his claim was not that he descended from Old Rory, but that his family represented the next of kin to the old MacLeod chiefs of Lewis. This John of Eleven Melbost has left various literary remains. In one undated note, he includes the information that in the old cemetery at I, 19 chiefs of the MacLeods are buried, the 19th evidently being the last man under the slab, John's great-great-grandfather, whom I shall henceforward refer to as 19 Torquil. 
Apart from that, I shall cite only John's letter of January 1953 to his niece Jo, in which he wrote, My ancestors always looked after the lairs of the MacLeods, although they were badly neglected for years gone by. Your great-great-great-grandfather had a quarrel with a certain farmer who wished to bury his son in the MacLeod's lair. The late Torquil MacLeod of Garibost claimed to be descended from the MacLeods of Lewis, but maintained that your great-grandfather was more in the direct line than he was. His son told Uncle Malcolm and I as much in 1948. The above-mentioned Torquil MacLeod of Garibost belonged to a family descended from Donald MacLeod of 17 Knock, born circa 1774, son of Murdo, which Donald was contemporary with John's great-grandfather Malcolm, born circa 1776, son of 19 Torquil. John's letter enables us not only to identify this related family claiming descent from the MacLeods of Lewis, but also to identify 19 Torquil with he who claimed Lewis belongs to me in Matheson's story of the prevented burial. 19 Torquil's family also came from the village of Knock, it having been his son Malcolm, born in Knock, who moved to Melbost. It would seem that Knock was the home of the surviving chiefly line, whence dispersed various branches bearing the chiefly named Torquil. My colleague, William Cumming, has investigated every 19th century bearer of the forenamed Torquil, who lived in Lewis, east of Stornoway, no matter what his surname, MacLeod, MacDonald, McKeever, Crichton or Monroe. And in every case, he managed to trace the probable origin of that forename back to one of a number of MacLeods who each came from the village of Knock. In the letter to his niece Jo, John also wrote, In my young days, all the old people in the Point District and out with looked upon my grandfather as the next of kin to the MacLeods of Lewis. The setting of that information dates to the 1880s, and its claim that this Melbos family was the next of kin to the MacLeod chiefs is supported by a tradition recorded two decades earlier. In August 1868, Alexander Carmichael, whom I mentioned earlier, took down the following items of information from Annis Macaulay, Crockner High, aged 82. Clan MacLeod MacTorkle, 18 under the stone at I. The last was Callum MacLeod, MacTor MacLeod, small crofter. He was the heir of the MacLeods. There is then a tale involving Ian Garve, the house of Ian Wiley and Annis Macaulay's great-great-grandmother, before the traditions return to the MacLeods of Lewis with this. A very handsome man was Torquilira, Torquilira of the ruddy cheeks. This was the first of the Lewes MacLeod. The heir is Torquil MacLeod in Melibost. Eglish Nahai is the oldest church in Lewes, also the berry place St Columb. John Wiley built one of those who came here from Fife, the left house pro in Stornoway. There are four main points to note here. The first point is that in writing his notes, Carmichael was struggling to keep up with what Annis Macaulay was saying. This is particularly obvious in the last paragraph, which is only semi-coherent. The meaning of its last sentence is unclear, but it may be connected with the first half of the previous sentence, John Wiley built, which seems to have been curtailed to make way for the information that John Wiley, presumably, was one of those who came here from Fife. Those last two sentences would seem to hark back to the earlier tale about Ian Garve. The first sentence of the last paragraph would, at first glance, seem to be claiming that Eglish Nahai was the burying place of St Columba, which it was not. So we can be fairly sure that we have here curtailed and abbreviated sentences that not only hark back to the contents of the first paragraph, but also should probably be read in full as Eglish Nahai is the oldest church in Lewis, and is also the burying place of the chiefs of the MacLeods of Lewis. It is dedicated to St Columba. The second point is that, according to Annis Macaulay, the last of the clan MacLeod MacTorkel to have been buried under the stone slab was only numbered 18, and was Callum, son of Tor, to which there are three sub-points to make. Sub-point one, 
Given that the name of the father of the eponymous Liao was definitely not Torkel, then Clan Torkel is perhaps a shorthand reference to that branch of the Clan MacLeod that was known as MacTorkel, i.e. the Shield Torkel or MacLeods of Lewis. Subpoint two, Annis's claim that there were 18 under the stone at I, agrees with Reverend John Cummins' numbering from 1833, with which we started this lecture. Subpoint three, Annis's identification of the 18th and last man buried under the slab as Callum MacLeod MacTor MacLeod, in which Tor presumably abbreviates Torkel, differs from the Melbos family's information that there were 19 chiefs of the MacLeods buried in the old cemetery at I, and that the last of them was John's great-great-grandfather, 19 Torkel, father of Malcolm. The similarity in the naming patterns and the difference of one in the numbering of the burials suggests that 18 Callum, son of Torkel, could have been the immediate predecessor and possible father of 19 Torkel, father of Malcolm. But whether or not that was so, the difference between the two claims is a puzzle, for which a speculative solution shall be offered later. The third and simplest of the four main points is that Annis Macaulay's The Heir is Torkel MacLeod and Melibost of 1868 is the same man as John and Melbost's great, uh, grandfather Torkel, who was born in 1811, died in 1891, and was, and was recognised as being the next of kin in the 1880s. There is no other possible candidate. The fourth and most contentious point concerns Torkel Ira of the Ruddy Cheeks, being described as the first of the Lewes MacLeod. The first MacLeod of Lewis, the founder of the Shield Torkel, was also the first MacLeod to have been named Torkel which was a name used by the McNichols. In an address to the Gallic Society of Inverness in 1979, William Matheson not only identified this first Torkel MacLeod with a Torkel Og, who was named in a tradition recorded in the 17th century Wardlaw manuscript, but also showed that this Torkel had inherited the estates of Lewis and Assent from his mother, the heiress of the McNichols. Therefore, in theory, he could also have been by named Ira, the heir. There is no problem in a man having more than one by name. However, there is a problem in trying to identify Torkel Ira with the first MacLeod of Lewis, Torkel Og, because as far as modern understanding of the genealogy goes, it was not until Matheson's address in 1979 that Torkel was made the son and thus the heir of the McNichol heiress. In 1868, when Carmichael recorded Annis Macaulay's tradition, the prevailing opinion was that the first Torkel MacLeod of Lewis was the husband of the McNichol heiress, which tradition is on record as early as circa 1684. And so it is unlikely that, in the 19th century, he was by named Ira. However, if Torkel Ira of the Ruddy Cheeks was not the original Torkel MacLeod of Lewis, then how could he be described as the first of the Lewis MacLeod? Given that, Maca given that Carmichael was struggling to keep up with what Annis Macaulay was saying, it might be that he had curtailed his sentence in order to record the next piece of information, which was that the heir is Torkel MacLeod in Melibost. If this speculation about a curtailed sentence is valid, then Torkel Ira would have been the first of the Lewis MacLeods to have done something that was noteworthy. But what? And given that his heir was apparently Torkel MacLeod and Melibost, who was he? The only Torkel Ira known to history was old Rory's only son by Barbara Stewart. But he died young, left no male issue, and does not seem to have achieved any notable first for a Lewis MacLeod. So it is very unlikely that he was the subject of Annis Macaulay's tradition. The speculation on whom that subject might have been and what he might have done can now be considered based upon the implications of accepting that Torkel Dew's son, William, left issue in the Hebrides. The acceptance that old Rory MacLeod of Lewis's legitimate male line grandson, William, left issue in the Hebrides has implications both for the history of Lewis and for the ancestry of the Melbost MacLeods, who claim to represent the next of kin of the old chiefs. The main implication is that that Melbost family descends in the male line from William. Unfortunately, there is no direct evidence, and certainly no proof, that that is the case. 
and one is left making speculations based upon the presumption of its truth. William was part of the entourage of Sir Rory MacLeod of Harris and, as we have learned from Hector MacLeod and Ben Beckler's tradition, four generations later, one of his descendants, Kenneth, was still based on the Harris estates when he and his family left Bernera for the Clan Ranald estates. For the Melbost family, this implies that one of their ancestors had moved to Lewis from the Harris estates. In other words, the Mackenzies must have allo allowed the return to Lewis of the chiefly line of the Shield Torkel. This seems like a pretty extraordinary thing to have happened. And yet, the example of the Barnich MacLeods means that we know that something like that did happen. It appears that the Barnich claimed descent from the last known warrior in the MacLeod cause, Malcolm, son of Rory Og, son of Old Rory, who is still raiding Mackenzie occupied Lewis as late as 1626. Apparently, his son Roderick was hidden by distant kin in Skye from kintail massacres. Therefore, after a period of exile in Skye, perhaps lasting a generation or so, the family, perhaps in the person of Roderick's son Angus Barn, who may have given his name to the Barnich, must eventually have returned to Lewis, where one of their number, Margaret MacLeod, wife of Colin Nicholson Babel and a sister of Roderick MacLeod, Rory Barn, was, circa 1900, <coughs> the last person interred in the old chapel at Eye. The example of the Barnich permits the possibility that someone of the chiefly line, belonging to a generation that played no part in the troubles of the Lewis, was allowed to settle in Lewis. But it is hard to work out when that might have happened. One would have thought that such an act of reconciliation would have required a stable background, with the Mackenzies confident that it would not upset their control of Lewis. But, with Malcolm MacLeod still under arms in the 1620s, the 1630s might seem to have been too soon for that, and by the end of that decade, Scotland was in a religious turmoil that was a prelude to the civil war throughout Britain in the 1640s that led to the Cromwellian occupation of Stornoway in August 1653. The failed attempt by the Earl of Seaforth's forces to retake Stornoway in January 1654 led to savage reprisals on the Mackenzies, in which the Englishmen were supported by the old natives, i.e. the MacLeods. William Matheson's papers contain an extract from a letter of May 1947 from Mr. Kenneth MacLeod of Fortrose Academy, who had written, As for the MacLeods I belong to, they have been resident in Garanin and Carloway for many generations. When Cromwell's officers invaded Lewis to suppress the Mackenzies, although the Macaulays and others served at Aldern in Seaforth's regiment, the MacLeods of our district and of Shawbost rose in support of the Englishmen, showing that they were not yet reconciled to the loss of their patrimony after 40 years. They couldn't have done this without leaders, but I have no trace of the latter. A returned descendant of old Rory, Rory of Lewis could well have supplied that presumed leadership. Speculating further, it may have been that leader whose funeral is described by Matheson as follows. It is said that John Morrison's well-timed intervention once prevented bloodshed between the Mackenzies and the MacLeods. Having established themselves in Lewis, the Mackenzies, for obvious reasons, made a point of claiming that the old ruling family of MacLeod had left no legitimate succession. The MacLeods, on the other hand, had no doubt as to the line of descent in which the chiefship of the clan lay, and continued to accord to the representative of that line all the appropriate honours. When he died, they made preparations to bury him in the tomb of the MacLeod chiefs at Agnish. On the day of the funeral, the Mackenzies made a hostile demonstration and threatened to disinter the dead man on the ground that he had no right to such a mark of recognition. At this point, John Morrison took action. He confronted the Mackenzies with a drawn sword in his hand and said, let Mackenzie have all of Lewis, but let MacLeod have the breadth of his back. The Mackenzies recognised that the bargain offered was to their advantage, involving as it did formal recognition by the Mackleods of the Earl of Seaforth as superior and saw fit to withdraw. To this, Matheson noted that 
The other side to the bargain he proposed, apparently, was that not only should the dead man be allowed to rest in peace, but that later representatives of the family should have the same right. This all gives the impression that this was the first burial of a MacLeod chief on Lewis to have occurred after the Mackenzies had conquered the island. However, for John Morrison of Braga to have brokered the peace as he did, he must by then have been a man of status. Presumably, he had already succeeded to the chiefship of the Morrisons in Lewis, and so probably was at least middle-aged. According to Matheson, Morrison must have been born about 1630. This rather suggests that the funeral may have occurred no earlier than the 1670s. Of course, such a date and such circumstances could fit not only a leader of the MacLeod forces in 1654, but also one who just happened to have been the first of his line to have returned to Lewis since the Chiefly family had been expelled by the Mackenzies. This is just speculation, admittedly, but it is plausible, and for this chief there is more. Torkeldew's son William was born circa 1595 and had a son, Tormod, Hector MacLeod and Ben Becula's ancestor, who was perhaps born circa 1620, to whom this chief could have been an elder brother, perhaps born circa 1619. On the presumption that he was adult at the time, it would seem that in his person, the return of the chiefly line to Lewis occurred in the 1640s. As William's eldest son, not only may he have been named Torkel after his paternal grandfather, Torkel Dew, but also he would have been the heir of the MacLeods of Lewis. He would have been the first of the Lewis MacLeods to have been buried in the chief's tomb in the church at Eye after the Mackenzies had conquered Lewis. This coincidence of possibilities enables us to speculate that it was this chief who, in Annis Macaulay's tradition, was Torkel Ira. In discussing the contested funeral and the number of buried chiefs, Matheson wrote, the figure quoted, whether 19 or 21, can be regarded as plausible only by supposing that it includes the individual whose rights were defended by John Morrison and a good number of his successors. The Melbos family's earliest ancestor to have been the subject of a statutory record of birth, death or marriage was Malcolm, son of 19 Torkel, who died in 1863 and who was born circa 1776. That birth year is 181 years later than the birth year of circa 1595 for his suggested ancestor, William, son of Torkel Du MacLeod and Lewis, <coughs> which, in the normal course of events, averaging circa 30 years per generation, would suggest that Malcolm was six generations in descent from William, meaning that 19 Torkel was five generations in descent from William, with his presumed predecessor and possible father, Annas Macaulay's 18 Callum, son of Torkel, possibly being fourth in descent from William. Even allowing for two chiefs per generation being buried under the slab during the four generations between William and 19 Torkel, which is probably too high an average anyway, that would require no fewer than 10 chiefs of the MacLeods of Lewis to have been buried at Eye before the time of William. Pedigree two on the handout shows that there were 11 chiefs of the MacLeods of Lewis before the time of William. Unfortunately, they were not all buried at Eye. Working through them in reverse order, we have 11 Tormod, who was banished from Scotland, and so he would have been buried abroad. 10 Torkeldew, who was put to death on the mainland by his enemies, and so it is unlikely that his corpse was returned to Lewis for burial. 9 Old Rory, last undisputed chief of the MacLeods of Lewis, who no doubt died in Lewis, and so he probably was buried at I. Eight, John, who died at Tain in Easter Ross, so he was probably buried there. Seven, Malcolm, whose gravestone is in Iona, so he was probably buried there. Six, Torkelog, who may have fled to Antrim and never returned, so he may have been buried abroad. 
Five, Rory Dew, who may be the subject of the effigy stone at Eye, and so he was probably buried there. Four, Rory Og, three, Torkel Yurzak, two, Rory Moore, and one, Torkel Og, all died during the Lordship of the Isles, so may have been buried in Iona. Therefore, it may be that only two of these chiefs, five Rory Dew and nine Old Rory, are buried at Eye. If the four chiefs who died during the Lordship of the Isles were buried at Eye instead of Iona, that would still only bring the total to six, meaning that our supposed Torkel Ira would have been the first of at least 13, but possibly as many as 19 chiefs of the MacLeods of Lewis who would have to have been buried at Eye during the supposed five generations down from William to 19 Torkel. Obviously, there is something badly wrong here because the number of chiefs buried at Eye is far too high. And so we have a problem, either with the numbering of the chiefs or with our understanding of that numbering. Luckily, we have a clue with which to solve the problem because this is not the first time that the count of the MacLeods of Lewis has been too high. <clears throat> About 1684, John Morrison of Braga, the peace broker in the story of the contested funeral, wrote a description of the Lewes, one passage in which concerns the first and most ancient inhabitants of this country, which were three men of three several races, of whom the third was MacNichol, whose only daughter Torquil, the first of that name, and son to Claudius, the son of Eliphius, who likewise is said to be the king of Norway, his son, did violently espouse and cut off immediately the whole race of MacNichol and possessed himself of the whole Lewes and continued in, in his posterity, MacLeod Lewes, during 13 or 14 generations and so extinct before or at least about the year 1600. Given that he was writing less than a century after the fall of the MacLeods, it might be thought that Morrison's count of their generations was carelessly vague, until one remembers that, when they fell, the MacLeods were being led by an association of the sons, e.g. Neil Lure, and grandsons, e.g. Malcolm, son of Rory Og, of old Rory MacLeod of Lewis, to whom, respectively, the 13th and 14th generations would refer. This would mean that old Rory himself represented the 12th generation. However, this count is too high, because reference to pedigree 2 shows that old Rory was only the fifth generation in descent from Torquil Og, who was the first MacLeod of Lewis, making Torquil Og the seventh generation in the count. That implies that there was six generations before him, and pedigree 1 shows that indeed there were, albeit these earlier generations were not MacLeods of Lewis. Morrison's excessive count of the generations of this family starts not with the first MacLeod of Lewis, but with the overall ancestor of the tribe to which the MacLeods belong. This explanation for the overcounting by Morrison enables one to explain the overcounting of the chiefs buried under the slab at I. The last of them, 19 Torquil, the Melbos family's earliest remembered ancestor, was not only supposedly the 19th chief so buried, but also, on the basis of average generation lengths of about 30 years, the fifth generation in descent from William, who, as a grandson of old Rory MacLeod of Lewis, belonged to Morrison's 14th generation of MacLeods. Of course, that means that the 19th generation just happens to be 19 Torquil, the 19th chief buried under the slab. That, surely, is not simply a massive coincidence. Instead, it is the explanation of why the number of the buried chiefs is far too high. The count is not that of the burial number of the chief at I, it is that of the generation number of the chief who was buried at I. This speculative understanding of the numbering means that Annas Macaulay's 18 Callum, son of Torquil, does indeed belong to the generation before the Melbos family's 19 Torquil, father of Malcolm. However, I do not believe that the two were father and son. 
Malcolm, son of 19 Torkel, was born circa 1776, and for the period 1766 to 1772, there survive some records of the tenants in Knock, where it seems the chiefly line was based, wherein one might have expected to find a notice of either 18 Callum or 19 Torkel as the chief MacLeod there. Indeed, from 1766 to 1769, the first listed tenant in Knock was a Torkel MacLeod, but his widow, Catherine, is on record in 1770. So this Torkel was obviously not 19 Torkel, whose son Malcolm was born circa 1776. In 1771, we find a Donald mm. McTorkel, who is in other records named Donald MacLeod, and who would appear to have been the son of the late Torkel. There is no mention at all of 18 Callum in these records, so it would appear that he, if a resident of Knock, had died before 1766. The Torkel who died circa 1770 would therefore seem to have been of the same generation as 18 Callum, leaving his son Donald to have been of the same generation as 19 Torkel. It is possible that 18 Callum was an older brother of the Torkel who died circa 1770 and whose son Donald could have been an older brother of 19 Torkel. And that we have here four consecutive closely related chiefs but this close relationship would not explain why Annis Macaulay treated 18 Callum and not 19 Torkel as the last under the slab. Such strange treatment leads to another speculation. Perhaps 18 Callum, possible great-grandson of Torkel Ira, was the last of the senior line in descent from Torkel Ira and was succeeded not by a brother, but by a cousin of some degree. Perhaps a second cousin descended from a second son of Torkel Ira, Possibly the Torkel who died circa 1770. Likewise, there is nothing to show that 19 Torkel was the brother of Donald. He could have been Donald's first or second or third cousin instead. Returning to the speculated extinction of the senior line in the person of 18 Callum, such a break in the succession could have given rise to three things. First, 18 Callum being remembered as the last of his line buried under the slab. Second, Callum's successors being treated not as part of the senior line, but as the next of kin. And third, a mistake in the numbering, with some persons thinking that the burial of the 18th chief under the slab referred not to his generation number, but to his burial number. And so they mistakenly incremented the count with each successive burial instead of with each successive generation, thereby wrongly increasing the count, as illustrated here. In this way, explained not only the old count of 18, but also how the later count diverged in tradition to produce the two different totals either 19 or 21, of the number of chiefs supposedly buried under the slab. Therefore, to answer the question in the title of this lecture, the proper number is neither 18 nor 21, but 19. But it refers not to the total number of chiefs who are buried under the slab, which total may actually have been as little as eight, but to the number of generations inclusive of in descent from the founder of the Schlocht Olver, of the last chief who is buried at I under the slab. <clears throat> Throughout this lecture, reference has been made to a stone slab in the church at I under which the chiefs of the family were buried. The last burial under it of the Melbos family's ancestor, 19 Torkel, probably took place about 200 years ago but the slab was not forgotten. Down through the generations, older members of the family pointed it out to the younger members. In the mid-20th century, John MacLeod of Lake Melbost showed it to his grandson, John Kennedy, and in August 2016, John Kennedy showed it to his distant kinsman, my aforementioned colleague, William Cumming, whose paternal grandmother, Anna MacLeod from 25 Sawdale, was related to that Torkel MacLeod at Garibost, mentioned in John MacLeod's letter to his niece, Jo. In that letter, John MacLeod described the slab as follows. There is no inscription on the slab, but a broadsword was carved on it. 
This raised carving is almost worn off with people walking over it to get to see the effigy and the inscription on Roderick MacLeod's tomb. Your uncle Malcolm took me to see this Torkel's tomb when he was here. My father showed it to him when he was quite young. So the slab under which were buried the dispossessed chiefs of the MacLeods of Lewis is the sword stone, one of the three early grave slabs from inside the church at Eye. The other two early grave slabs can be termed the effigy stone and the inscription stone. The inscription stone, the only one of the three slabs on which an inscription was found, commemorates not Roderick MacLeod of Lewis, but his daughter Margaret, the widow of Lachlan MacKinnon, and records her death in 1503. Margaret, who could have been born circa 1455, may have been the daughter of that Roderick MacLeod who is supposedly commemorated by the effigy stone, which was, according to W.C. Mackenzie, probably that of Roderick MacLeod, 8 of Lewis, late 15th century. That Roderick MacLeod, sorry, 7 of Lewis, not 8 of Lewis, that Roderick MacLeod, 7 of Lewis, in the old accounts, was, according to my reinterpretation of the genealogy, a confusion of two chiefs, those numbered 4 and 5 on pedigree 2 on the handout, namely Rory Og, who may have been buried in Iona, and Rory Dew. Rory Dew is on record in 1492 and 1494, but his chiefship had come to an end by 1498, when Torkel Og is first on record. The effigy stone may commemorate Rory Dew, who may have been the first chief of the MacLeods of Lewis to be buried in the church at Eye. This leaves just the sword stone, and the knowledge that old Rory may have been the only other chief who was buried at Eye whilst the MacLeods were the lords of Lewis. It is hard to resist putting those two points together to make what will be the last two of the many speculations presented in this lecture. Such speculations are necessary because, sadly, the proofs simply no longer exist. And so one must gather the scattered fragments of evidence and do one's best to interpret them in such a way as to make sense of their various contradictions. That is what I have tried to do today with the numbering of the chiefs buried at I and I hope that it has been of interest to you. The last two speculations in this lecture are, first, the sword stone is the grave slab of old Rory MacLeod of Lewis, and second, the later dispossessed chiefs, the Shield Torkel, were buried in the grave under the sword stone because they were the male line descendants of its first occupant, old Rory, the last undisputed chief of the MacLeods of Lewis. Thank you for listening to me. The end. Sorry? How is the Australian film related to the um, The Australian... Mm, mm, Torkel Donald MacLeod of the Loos, as recognised by Lord Lyme, is actually... <laughs> now I'm on record here, this is a bit... Is actually the head of the MacLeods of Raza. Um, and it was his father, Torkel Roderick, Chief of the MacLeods of Raza, who had, who, um, had himself recognised by the Lord Lion as also Chief of the MacLeods of Lewes, and then divided the chiefships between his two sons. So Donald, the eldest son, who should really be MacLeod of Raza, is MacLeod of the Lewes, and his younger brother John is MacLeod of Raza. Now, the MacLeods of Raza supposedly descend from a brother of old Rory MacLeod of Lewis. On the genealogy in the handout, he doesn't appear there because that ancestry for the MacLeods of Raza is wrong. The evidence is that old Rory had no brothers, which is why Donald Gorm MacDonald of Slate, after the death of Torquil Ira in, 15, in December 1565, um, contended with Torquil Conanac 
for the um, to be the heir of the Macleans of Lewis. Um, his his mother was the daughter of Macleod of Lewis, but um, ever since Donald Gregory, he's been given her, his mother has been given the wrong father because it was thought that old Rory Macleod of Lewis had a brother not only in Malcolm Garth Macleod of Raza but also in Norman Macleod of Edrigillis. The Macleods of Raza, um, historically, their lineage goes back to a generation before Malcolm Macleod of Lewis of 1511. And the earliest accounts say that they share a common ancestry with the MacLeods of Gerlock, who are recognised as being the earliest offshoot of the MacLeods of Lewis. That's why they're both called the Shield of Gillichan. Um, MacLeod of Raza appears in the 1572 charter to Torkel Conanach as being successor to Torkel Conanach if Torkel Conanach and his heirs male die out, purely because he was in the pro Mackenzie camp. MacLeod's Ar uh, the Isa massacre. Uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> there is a whole load of um, changes to the history and the genealogy that is going on that has not yet been mentioned on this. This, this lecture is a bit far down the line, and the Isa massacre, in published accounts, is dated to the late 1560s <coughs> for reasons that Donald. Mac Gregory, back in the early 19th century, thought valid. The evidence points to the Isa massacre having occurred rather, rather in 1544. And it wasn't committed by um, Ro Roderick MacLeod of Gerlock. It was committed by Roderick Mac old Rory MacLeod of Lewis. Uh, he, after all, owned the island of Isa off the coast of Waternish. Gregory never explained how Roderick MacLeod of Gerlock could hold a feast on the on Ilanaza at which he wiped out the rest of the Shieldvik Gillikalem of Gerlock and Raza. The Shieldvik Gillikalem were closely connected with Mackenzie's, and it's old Rory trying to wipe out Mackenzie influence in a separate branch of his clan because Gerlock and Raza never belonged to the MacLeods of Lewis. They were separate holdings. Old Rory almost extinguished Shield at Gillyhallam. Malcolm Garve, who's given as the first in the clouds of Raza, was actually the grandson of the person who appears as Malcolm Garve in the history books. The nickname, by name Garve, has been set back two generations through a whole load of errors that go on. And basically he was the sole survivor of the massacre of his immediate family because he'd been fostered away and didn't attend the banquet, which old Rory had all the others killed off. With that background, it's no wonder that Malcolm Garve ended up in the pro-Mackenzie camp and married an illegitimate daughter of Mackenzie of Kintail. So that 1572 charter, which old Rory revoked as soon as he was able to, Torkel Conanach is the main beneficiary. His mother was a Mackenzie. The second is Malcolm Garve, whose wife and the mother of his legitimate sons was Mackenzie. And they're the only two men, um, mentioned in the charter as succeeding. That charter of 1572, upon which the MacLeods of Raza um, title to MacLeod of Lewis is based, doesn't mention at all the gene any genealogical relationship between Malcolm Garve and Torkel Conanac. It, it, it's, ta it's just assumed that there's a relationship there. And um, <coughs> uh, who was it? In Douglas's Baronage in 1798, they're made brothers. But there's no suggestion in that charter that they are actually brothers. They were contemporary and they were in the pro Mackenzie camp as opposed to the pro Macdonald camp. And Norman MacLeod of Edricillus was also contemporary, but he wasn't the first of Edricillus, and the MacLeods of Edricillus, anyway, are a senior offshoot of the MacLeods of Assint. I suspect, but I haven't yet looked into it properly, that the MacLeods of Edricillus were also pro Mackenzie. It's known the Mackenzies had an eye on Sutherland, and it could have been that they were 
trying to use the clouds of Edricillus as their way in, which might explain why they were almost wiped out by the Mackays of Strathnava. But um, the, the accounts say that Old Rory had two brothers, Malcolm Garver Raza and Norman MacLeod of Edricillus, and that's just not true. Who? I do. Uh, well, before uh, the clouds of Raza first um, matriculated arms as MacLeod of Lewis in the person of John MacLeod, who'd hosted Boswell and Johnson. And I can't remember when, he, was that 1776 or something? But over a dozen years prior to that, John MacLeod of Colbeck's, an estate a plantation in Jamaica, had become, had become a very wealthy man. Um, he also matriculated at arms as MacLeod of Lewis. Lord Lyon accepted him as being MacLeod of Lewis, even though the lineage that he gave couldn't possibly have reached back to a brother of old Rory that he claimed he was descended from. Um, I, the MacLeods of Colbeck seem to be descended from the MacLeods of Hackleet and would therefore seem to have been a branch of the clan Tormod um, who appear on the pedigree two or the handout as being descended from um, Tormod Moore, who is, who is probably a brother of Rory Dew, the sort of usurping chief of the MacLeods of Lewis. And, and it's in, in his usurpation that you have the start of the civil war between the MacLeods of Lewis, which lasted for over 100 years, although it died down a bit, then flared up again with Torquil Connick, and which led to the Mackenzies taking Lewis from the MacLeods. Sorry, rather a long and involved answer to your question there. Um, but this lecture, as I say, it's a bit far down the line. I, I was just merrily beavering away on working on all these things without having any knowledge how to get things published. Or, And it was my colleague, William Cumming, who met up with this chaplain and said, look, do you know what this sword stone in the, in the church is all about? And it led to me giving this lecture here tonight. But really, before we, before we ever came to this lecture, there should have been a whole load of other lectures or other articles published, um, which haven't been in all, uh, We Last, where are we? We're, we're, fr we're Friday. Last Saturday, William put online on his website um, three articles of mine, one of which explains... Uh, it's, it's called Bloody Bay and the MacLeods, explains my revision to the genealogy of the MacLeods of Lewis. Um, so one week before the lecture, we were desperately trying to get these things put on. Um, and of course, off the top of my head, I can't remember the website, but I could dig it out from a, a letter a little bit afterwards. But uh, before I do that, are there any other questions? Sorry, where was... That massacre, but... Oh, no yes. I, again, Gallic and my inability to speak it. it um, Isa, Isa, off the coast of Wartonish in Skye. Because MacLeod of Lewis possessed the estate of Wartonish in Skye, the estates of Assend and Coigac on the mainland, as well as... Sorry? I reckon it was 1544. Um book since Donald Gregory, uh, History of the um, Western Highlands and Islands of Scotland, and placed it in the late 1560s, um, because Gregory's description of the massacre occurs under a page heading of 1569, because he I'd misidentified the perpetrator of the massacre, um, which in all the narrative accounts is Rory MacLeod of Lewis. But Gregory... Identi misidentified him with Roderick MacLeod of Gairlock, who is on record in 1569, uh, which is why 1569 appears at the top of the page in which he's describing Roderick MacLeod of Gairlock and goes into the description of the Isa massacre. Um, the fact that the perpetrator, Old Rory, was never brought to justice for the crime, even though it was well known that it was him, Plus, the birth dates of, the, of Malcolm Garve, who I reckon must have been born about 
1535, the sole survivor, and he was supposed to be nine years old at the time of the massacre, which would put the massacre to 1544, which is smack in the middle of the Second Great Rebellion in support of Donald Dew, MacDonald of the Isles, in order to make him Lord of the Isles. In which rebellion, old Rory MacLeod of Lewis was one of the leading uh, lights, and he obtained um, a remission for his participation in that rebellion, which basically meant anything that he did in the rebellion, he couldn't be charged with. So although everybody knew it was old Rory, he was never brought to justice for it if it occurred during this rebellion. And the actual, the sole survivor of the family who uh, attended um, the feast on Andesa, I reckon that was Rory MacLeod of Gairlock, who is the sister's son of old Rory, which is why he was spared. He's not actually specified in any of the accounts to be been Rory MacLeod of Gairlock, but considering the accounts say that he subsequently um, you know, took possession of Gairlock and also for a period Raza. And it is known that the later MacLeods of Gairlock all descend from this Rory MacLeod of Gairlock who would have been a young man at the time of the massacre. It seems fairly obvious that he was this unnamed nephew of old Rory who, who was MacLeod, uh, who, who was the... Um, son by MacLeod of Gairlock's second marriage to old Rory's sister. MacLeod of Gairlock's first marriage had been to a Mackenzie, and his two sons by that marriage were victims of the Isa massacre. Um, so, yeah, massacre 1544, I reckon. I mean, but you'll not find it written as 1544. It's given as 1568 or 1569, all, all because of Donald Gregory changing the story and saying that it was Roderick MacLeod of Gairlock who committed it rather than old Rory MacLeod of Lewis. <laughs>